Hey, it's Huck. Now, it was my intention to talk to you a few days ago, right after the second set of Republican debates. You know, the ones that were held on CNN the other day. But old Huck needed several days of time alone in recovery after five full hours of that much stupid. It was entertaining, though, in a way. I mean, we got to see Donald Trump once again resort to foolish sixth grade personal attacks from time to time, though I suspect he realized very early on that this was not his particular audience in the room, and he seemed to lose energy from that point on. We learned Lindsey Graham, Senator from South Carolina has a good sense of humor, but really can't string together three sentences in a row without urging on another war somewhere. We learn that the governor of Ohio, John Kasich, wants to be perceived as the adult in the room, or at least a throwback to Republicans who compromised from time to time and worked with Democrats to try to get something done in Washington, which of course explains why in today's GOP, his post-debate poll numbers plunged. We learned Rand Paul can at times speak rationally on issues like the inherent unequal criminal justice system between black drug offenders and white drug offenders, particularly if those white offenders are connected to wealth or power like Jeb Bush was 40 years ago. Chris Christie vehemently disagreed, basically arguing, fuck them. Carly Fiorina interjected that she was the only one on the panel to lose a child to drugs, not mentioning that she actually never had a child herself, but that it was her husband's 35-year-old daughter who died mixing alcohol and prescription drugs, uh, which are legal. Paul also gave an impassioned plea for some sanity based on past experience when it comes to war policy, which of course was quickly attacked by everyone else on the panel. After all, military spending is good business, and true Republicans are supposed to be all about business, not sanity. But I guess the things that stood out to old Huck here after watching it all boil down to two main observations. My first observation is that on issues, the Republican Party really isn't nearly as divided as people seem to think it is. It's just that, well, half of the party is actually all out committed to racist, gun nut, and religious radicalism, while the other half only interjects those positions every election cycle to motivate what is increasingly their core constituency. But establishment Republicans don't really want to risk jeopardizing the country's bond rating, for instance, or shut down the government over those issues either. The problem is, ever since Richard Nixon developed this Southern strategy to cater to bigots, and ever since Karl Rove refined the manipulate the base strategy of concentrating on the evangelical vote, more and more across the country, these bigots, science-denying religious fanatics, have not only been showing up to vote in greater numbers, but they've been running and winning elections. And just a little word on the continuing influence of Newt Gingrich's strategy in what we see today. It was Newt Gingrich who came up during the 1990s in the Bill Clinton administration with a motto that all Republicans pretty much know and follow, which was, relentless attack is its own Teflon. And what this essentially means is that if you repeat it often enough and consistently enough, people will begin to accept it as being true. This strategy has been helped in no small part by the fact that Republicans largely now have their own news network where they can pretty much say whatever they want and not be challenged on it. This network being headed and developed by a former pretty nasty Republican operative itself. And increasingly other networks and other journalists 
other people in the media are getting, you know, pretty intimidated on even challenging these folks because they know that if they continue to try to challenge them on some of their statements or some of their views, they'll simply refuse to cooperate with them and won't show up as a guest or as a, uh, an interview in the future. But what seems to be so shocking today to establishment Republicans is that rather than merely using these divisive issues and strategies to win elections, their use every election cycle has now put so many bigots, evangelical fanatics, and successionist gun nuts in office who care more about these issues than anything else. When all along, all the establishment Republicans really cared about was squeezing every last tax dollar out of government and back into the hands of the billionaires and their corporations. On this, it should be noted that virtually both halves of the Republican Party agree that government itself should do everything necessary to keep billionaires and their corporations safe and free to make as much money as humanly possible without constraint of pesky health or environmental regulations or tax policies designed to share some of their enormous wealth. The second thing I observed was that the Republican Party has thus devolved into a platform where virtually everything that is said, believed, or proposed in their debates is a departure from reality. And this, of course, makes it a ludicrous task to even attempt to effectively fact-check their statements. Oh, there were some limited efforts to fact-check a few things. Carly Fiorina's use of graphic depictions of an aborted fetus, which were not on the Planned Parenthood videos she claims that she watched. The statement of Jeb Bush, who said he knows one thing for certain, how his brother George kept America safe. And perhaps there were a few other examples of low-hanging fruit during the debates. But the fact is, virtually everything said was a lie or based on a lie, and no one anywhere during or after the debates seemed to mind. Carly Fiorina, for instance, proposes some $500 billion in additional military buildup expenses, yet she also seeks deeper tax cuts, all in the face of an $18 trillion debt. And nobody called her out on where she's going to come up with that money. Ayatollah Bobby Jindal, governor of Louisiana, repeated his absurd base rally cry, immigration without assimilation is invasion. No one, not even his opponents, called him out on this. I'd like to know why Jindal seems to direct this at just Mexicans and Muslims, because that's who he means. Are we to believe that under Bobby Jindal we would also dismantle every Chinatown in America? Is he calling for every Hasidic Jew to assimilate? The Amish? Native American culture? And then there's Jeb Bush, who seeks another round of tax cuts, 53% of which would go to benefit the very wealthiest in this country, who seem to be doing better already than at any time in human history, thank you very much. Now, how does he justify his call to phase out safety net programs like Medicare, Social Security, that are lifelines to our growing elderly population due to possible bankruptcy from inadequate funding, yet give the wealthiest corporations and citizens the world has ever known even less of a tax burden that could help? Of course, he can justify this privately, because Republicans largely believe in no government, at least as little government as absolutely necessary to allow the rich and their companies to exploit the masses and the world as a whole for every last dime they can hoard for themselves. All they really require are legislatures, a president, and a high court that will let them do it, an armed police state that silences any armed resurrection against it, and a bloated military equal to all others in the world combined in order to carry out their greedy scheme. Fact is, 
I learned very little in the five-hour marathon the other night. Nothing I didn't already know. It just reinforced my knowledge that there is actually nothing the Republican Party has to say that is honest or rational. If you strip away the lies and fantasies, they have nothing to say. Nothing. I'm Huck. That's my opinion. I'd love to hear yours. Please leave a comment down below, and I'll see you again real soon.